Welcome to Books in the World, the longest running literary cable TV program in the country, conducting interviews with authors and publishers for over 40 years. Books in the World is a production of the Cape Cod Writers Center. I am your host, Elisa Metcalf, and today I am excited to welcome Hazel Belvo. We're mixing things up today because Hazel is not the author of the book, but she is the subject of the book. And it is called Hazel Belvo, A Matriarch of Art. And it is a gorgeous coffee table book, um, comprehensive book that covers Hazel's life as an artist, teacher, feminist, and activist, and was written by Minnesota art historian Julie Lenfant and published by Afton Press. First of all, Hazel, congratulations on this book. It is really, really beautiful. Um, you must be excited <laughs> that you were asked to be the subject of this. Yeah, it was a great book and it was really a, a great experience to work with Julie. Terrific. So how did this book come to come about? Um, like how did, how did they decide they wanted you to be the subject and, and how did all that work? Well, um, I've been a part of the art scene out here in Minnesota for a long time. And um, the original publisher of Afton Press uh, had bought a large uh, rose tree painting of mine. And um, I believe it's, uh, it's in the book. Um, and, um, and she asked if she could do a monogram uh, on my life and work. And, um, then she selected Julie LaFont, who had written for her before, to write the book. And, uh, and uh, subsequently then, um, Mrs. McDonald died and um, uh, Ian Leash purchased the uh, publishing company and continued the project. Uh, and I was very pleased about that. Great, well, it's, it really is. It's a beautiful book. So. <laughs> so Hazel, when did you first discover your love of painting and drawing? Well, I think when I was a kid, I, I was drawing all the time. I, uh, my mother said that um, uh, she and we lived in an old stone farmhouse and- um, uh, In Ohio. Not, in Ohio, yeah, Southern Ohio. And, um, <clears throat> There wasn't a plane in the house that was the same. And she and my grandmother had taken a long time to re to wallpaper the living room and dining room. And then they went out in the kitchen and had a cup of coffee. And, um, and, uh, and then my mother said, oh, where's Hazel Lee? And um, then they went, found me in the dining room and I had drawn the whole wall, the dining room with my crayons. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother said that I was so proud and pleased that she didn't have the heart to reprimand me. They just, <laughs> so. And the rest is history. <laughs> and then when I was in grade school, I was the, always the one who um, did all the drawings on the blackboard and, and, um, and then I think I was in about the fifth grade when I got the scholarship to go to the Dayton Art Institute Saturday classes for kids. And, uh, and that made a huge difference to me because I got, I made friends with all the paintings in the museum and um, it was a, a first formal, we didn't have art in the school. I went to a country school and uh, there was no art, but, um, but that, that Dayton Art Institute Saturday School was an amazing place for me as a kid. And I went there until I graduated from high school. That's and, terrific. Uh, yes. It was, a great opportunity for a, a child. Mm -hmm. It was a, a doctor who lived there, gave um, scholarships to uh, the little country schools that surround Dayton. So several schools got to send someone. And I took a Greyhound bus from, um, from our bus stand mm -hmm. uh, where it stopped 10 miles uh, by myself. 
and we got off in the city and walked uh, two miles to the museum every Saturday. That was so the classes were held in the museum then. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh, so wow, that's, that's great. Anyway, that was wonderful. And um, and I actually I've met other artists in New York who had similar experience from the other schools, and right. uh, um, and that's always very. Um, um, informative to me about the value of teaching and um, and education. Anyway, sure. my mother had a meat cutting business, custom meat cutting for the farmers. And um, I, as a young person, I would wrap the cut pieces of meat and then draw on the outside of the package. So that was <laughs> another kind of drawing I did. And then in, uh, in school, I in Latin, I I, um, I painted in gouache the uh, the whole voyage, the adventure of Aeneas, Aeneas and the Golden Fleece. It's a, a Latin story, and um, around a whole room in the school. And then in biology, I drew all the body parts, and that fascinated me more than anything, actually. <laughs> and, uh, bones uh, in the meat. Uh, so there wasn't there wasn't much other option for you, was it? I mean, this this path was chosen early on. <laughs> the truth is that that growing up that way was really an, an asset. All the different ways I looked at making images mm -hmm. and kinds of images. And right. Anyway, and then so then as a teenager, you opened a studio and did portraits and made some money that way, right? Yes, and I, I painted a, a number of portraits in that area. And, uh, but then um, I went to Ohio State um, at, for a year, but I went, I left and went back to, I missed the, I missed the, it was a tremendous uh, cultural uh, for me. And I went back to the farm and, and I continued studying at the Dayton Art Institute mm -hmm. in the college classes. So, and then I went to New York City when I was 25. Right. So, all right, and so you were in. You went to college, and then in '60, you met. Uh, there was a visiting artist, George Morrison, and uh, you met him there at the Dayton Institute. Mm -hmm. And George was a Native American uh, landscape painter and sculptor, also you know from Minnesota. Uh, and, Ojibwe. He was an Ojibwe man. Ojibwe. Mm -hmm. But when I met him, he had already had. Uh, 15 one-man shows in New York and wow. lived here. We were, he was quite a lot older than I. And um, so living in New York with him was terrific. And, and that's when I met Sally Metcalf, my best friend. Yes, my, so full disclosure. Yes, I, Hazel is not a stranger to me. <laughs> I've known her most of my life, uh, if not all of my life. Hazel and my mother were the best of friends. And in fact, this lovely backdrop <laughs> behind me uh, was a gift that Hazel gave to my mother. So this beautiful painting. Um, but yeah, so there in, in New York City, um, you, you lived there for a time. And also uh, Cape Cod, Provincetown specifically. Um, you spent some time there. 17 years. And mm -hmm. um, Provincetown in the 60s was an incredible place. I... I longed for nature. Um, the way I got it in New York was um, I would, I made regular trips on the Staten Island Ferry just to see a skyline, to see a <laughs> horizon line <laughs> and uh, spent a lot of time in Central Park and um, lived across the street from Tompkins Square Park. And, uh, but so I loved the city and, uh, and the whole art world that was there. And, and made some very good and important friends and influences in New York at that time. Um, but then all the summers were left, were spent in Provincetown. And um, in Provincetown in the 60s was a rather incredible place to be. Sure. And tell, tell us again how you, um, your first experience when you and George were driving through Truro and you came over the big hill before Provincetown and he stopped the car to show you. Oh, he you said, know. actually, I was driving the car because he didn't drive. He didn't drive, right. <laughs> but, uh, so he, he, he 
uh, directed me to stop at uh, at Long Nook and Truro, and and I had I really didn't know its magnificence. I we got out. Right, you're from the middle of the country. <laughs> it was it was um, it was in it was in the evening. It was sunset, and we walked through the passage, the sand passage with the dunes on both sides. And I, and I saw it for the first time. It was um, transforming, actually. Um, I've had about three transformative experiences in nature, and that's one of them. That wow. was really important wow. to me. So that was my introduction to Provincetown. Right. And, and you worked there, too. So you, 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 had a house, you rented a house there um, and, and worked a, quite a bit there. 19 years. Um, law on Law Street, and yep. um, yes, it was great. The combination of the artist community and the Portuguese people was a such an interesting combination, and uh, yeah. um, and the and, and the Provincetown Bakery, the Portuguese Bakery. Oh, of course, yes. Was then my I had three boys, and they would go in the morning. One of them would always go buy flippers and we'd have flippers for breakfast. It was great. And uh, of course. <laughs> when we, we always did a lot of dancing at uh, the back room. Mm -hmm. A lot of spent a lot of afternoons, later afternoons at the Folksal. And um, right, the good old Folksal. Good old Folksal. When us kids needed dinner, we knew where to find our parents. <laughs> <laughs> Across from the library. Right. <laughs> sit at the library and watch. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, so that's great. Had a great time. It was a great time for kids because my oldest Joe and his friend Dana, they he loved night fishing and they could fish all night at the right. water. Yes, and the and the other fisher people would watch out for them. It was oh. really um, yeah, it was very safe and you know, fun, fun, festive, fun. creative, sure, very inspiring. And yes, it was. Good. It was in the air and the honeysuckle that grew next door. Right. And, uh, you could walk down Law Street and there would be the big moon up there. Mm -hmm. It's great. Oh, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. And the friends I made, the artists were very, um, it was such a fulfilling time. The, the, um, interaction of all the artists and right. uh, uh, yeah it was and I did a lot of work yeah I uh, it was during that time I was at um, um, at um, the Harvard Radcliffe um, uh, Bunding Institute and um, uh, so I had the means to be able to work and I could get um, uh, always had a student who would watch the boys while I had working hours. And, uh, Perfect. Right. Yeah. And it was there that I started the love drawings. That's I, featured in the book. It's mentioned, in, it's mentioned in your book, yeah. in the Matriarch of Art. Actually, Afton Press is publishing a book of the love drawings. Oh, so, terrific. Yes. Well, then there. we're going to have to have you back when that comes out. <laughs> I'll be back in... Uh, 24. Terrific. Yeah. So yeah. in addition to you've had, um, you know, a long career as a successful career as an artist and, but in addition to your six decades of producing this beautiful art and showing, you've had a really long career as a teacher as well, almost just as long. So, you know, my question is, do you get as much fulfillment from teaching as you do from creating your own stuff? Well, it's not the same. I mean, the, the fulfillment, but what is the same is the process. And um, I don't think that every artist can teach. I think you have to have a really, um, for me, teaching was an, in a way like a ministry, I think. Um, and, and the process is, it's like painting. It, it, takes, it, it takes full attention and um, it takes a lot of listening. Uh, I mean, when you're painting, you're listening to your work, really. And, um, and then there's a dialogue, and I love the dialogue that goes on between ideas and 
um, history and um, all the possibilities uh, that, uh, that, that people uh, create and- um, Sure. And, um, and then and your students also are, it, you know, and it's uh, mentioned in the book also, you know, how grateful your students are for you. They loved you. They were, they found you extremely <laughs> informative and inspiring. Um, you know, they wrote letters to the books. They've written letters to you, you know, many years later. They never forget you. Um, that must feel pretty good. It does. It's yeah. good. Wonderful, but you know the most wonderful of all is seeing what they're doing now. What they're right. offering—it's it's amazing. Um, so you're still in touch with a lot of the students. Oh, I've been really privileged to teach some amazing people. Yes, I am in touch with them, and uh, yeah, many are professors, mm -hmm. for example, um, writers, art history people. I had a student who was an absolutely beautiful painter, beautiful painter. And, and now she's an astrophysicist in Europe and she studies- Oh, what a waste. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so in addition to you know, your career teacher and artist, um, you've always been very active in social justice causes and are especially outspoken about, about women's issues. And I read in the book that it talks about how um, the majority of students, 75% of art students are women, but the ratio between how many women get exhibited publicly um, is much, much lower than that. Is that, do you think that's changing now? Actually, I do. I think that there's a lot more attention given, and there's been some great publications and um, even at this year's, um, in the Venice Biennale, two women were the most important artists and things like that are happening. I think mm -hmm. the art world is a difficult art world, uh, is a, a difficult world because especially in this country, it doesn't have um, much prestige. It isn't like in Europe, you get off an airplane in Europe and you say you're an artist and you are welcome and given opportunities, uh, cards to museums, and a lot of appreciation, but that doesn't happen here. It's, um, it's a very different kind of world. And um, I, I learned a, a many years ago that there are three parts to the art world. One is the creation, another is um, um, the business of art, and the other is the history of art. So. Um, they and all of them combined. Uh, the hardest one for me is the business of art, and uh, but I I've thought a lot about what what it's it's essential to me what women contribute to uh, aesthetics in our country, um, and I I think it would be a very uh, barren place without all these this percentage of women being in art right. school. Sure. What they contribute, including the next generation, you know. Of right. So, yes, I think my most political work, however, has been the, 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 um, the love drawings. What was the inspiration for those? Um, well, I was sitting on the Law Street Beach one day with your mother and she uh, turned to me and she said, she said, Hazel, what would you like to do that you've never done before? And I said, well, I'd like to travel around the world. <laughs> she said, no, I mean in your work. And so then I was telling her that my oldest son, his generation, and uh, they, um, he was in the first class for sex education being taught in the public schools. And he showed me the pamphlet that they give out. It was visually terrible. It was so, <laughs> it was so flat and cartoonish and um, sterile. I thought to myself, how a young person understand that this is a beautiful thing. Sure. These images. So 
in the, I think it was about the 13th century in Japan, there were these beautiful books called pillow books and they're at the Metropolitan Museum and they're instructional for young people uh, about making love. And I said, I'd like to make, make a book. So um, Sally said, well, why don't you do that? And I said, well, I can't because I need models. So she said, well, let me and I'll pose for you. <laughs> So that's how it happened and uh, how it started. And I, I worked on these drawings from 1967 to 1983. And you got other volunteers as well. And, so. yeah, friends. <laughs> and uh, friends and even, um, yes, mostly friends. I was gonna say one, one couple that I, rare, that I knew very uh, barely. But, but, but they were wonderful. And um, anyway, um, uh, I had a lot of experience showing those drawings and I showed them several times in Provincetown. And um, there were some times when, uh, um, well, one time I went to the gallery, it was right downtown and all the drawings were off the wall and then sitting on the floor, facing the wall. And uh, the, the police had come and um, taken them down. Really? Yes. Because what year was this? Like this was in the 60s? It, it, I think it was 68 or maybe it was a little later than that, 72 maybe. But um, no, yeah. And, um, and the reason for that was, um, uh, the Massachusetts law, I believe, said that in order to see intimate work like that, somebody, you, the viewer has to initiate it. So the viewer would have to turn the paintings around, uh -huh. the drawings around, in order to see them, and that made them participatory. So interesting. Yes, and that, well, lots. Of, I could tell you story after story about that. <laughs> well, I do want to say that the spirit tree here in, um, it's up on Lake Superior. The spirit tree has, mm -hmm. has been a subject for me for since 1961. I, I have studied that, painted that. Sure, and, yes, and it's featured very prominently in the book as well, yeah. all the different entities and, mm -hmm. you know, as your uh, evolution as an artist too, how the, your, your interpretation of it changes. Um, but yeah, it's beautiful, very beautiful. It's political because, because it is to remind people of the importance of nature and the importance of ecology and uh, importance to our human lives of trees, right. which absorb the carbon dioxide. And, mm -hmm. and this tree, it's growing out of a rock by the looks of it, right? Roots the are survivor, the, the survivor tree, yeah. um, majestic. I think the, the, the other, another subject that I have pursued for years is the sense of place. And I have a lot of paintings of Provincetown that are about the place, the sense of place. Right. And um, it was in, um, in, in 1985, I met Marsha Cushmore. We are partners in life. And uh, she is a philosopher by training. And then she went to art school. And, also a uh, lover of art, yes. yes. And so we have traveled the world and painted together. We have um, um, established what I call a studio and a backpack. So we can travel any place in the world with a duffel bag and a backpack. And, um, and we have done that. One of our great places uh, is Giverny Monet's garden. And uh, so we had permission to paint there we got permission to be in the garden in 1987, and we could go before it opened in the morning uh, to, at 10 o'clock it opens to um, the public. So we could go uh, in the morning up until 10 o'clock. And then when it closed at five, we could go until it got dark. So we had the garden to ourselves, and I've done many work somewhere in the book um uh, ab about the garden 
And, uh, and the rose trees, that there's a row of rose trees in front of Monet's house, between the house and the garden. And I have uh, another whole series of paintings called Rose Trees. So Yeah, and that's featured. And the, um, the, your travels also are featured in the book, everywhere you went and yeah. the painting and your, your rituals while you were there. I mean, it really is a terrific book. I mean, Hazel, you've lived a, a wonderful life um, full of great people and travels and experiences uh, and that, you know, I'm so happy you were selected for this, for this book because because you're so deserving and truly are a matriarch of art. <laughs> it's a page that has my progeny in it. And um, I have 15 great grandchildren. They're all on one page which I think is wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I do. So, and one thing that Marcia and I did on all, all our travels, well, well, I always paint the trees. So I've found trees in Korea that are like from the 11th century and olive trees in Greece that were four big olive trees that I photographed and drawn that were here in, at the time of Christ. And um, anyway, places like that, that we've investigated and uh, studied together. Um, and uh, one of the things that we try to do is go uh, to artist studios. So we've, we've visited a number of artist studios around the world. Uh, mm -hmm. In in uh, in, Lin in um, Great Britain, um, Barbara Hepworth is a sculptor there. She has a wonderful studio, and and Monet's of course, and El Greco in in Greece, and um, uh, just well, that's great. And yes, and this is all documented in the book, so I definitely recommend people go go get the book to learn more about Hazel's life. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, but you are, you have a show coming up, don't you, Hazel? Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that the work up behind me, mm -hmm. it's, a work, it's a body of work that Marsha and I have done together called Juxtaposition. And we just had the big show of that, uh, which was very well received and reviewed. And, um, and, I, and I have uh, two retrospectives coming up. Okay, too. great. Yeah, one is at the Plains Art Museum on September 24th to January 14th. I think it opens September 10th. Oh, September 10th, okay. And then the other one is in, in, in 24. It's at the Minnesota Museum of American Art. 2024, okay. I like that, that year I'll be 90. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hazel, thank you so much for... Um, taking time to come on the program. I really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, I wish you continued success with your, with your work. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. All right. So thank you for watching Books in the World. For more information about our educational programs and seminars, or to find out about upcoming writers, our write, upcoming writing, writers conference, <laughs> to find out about our upcoming writers conference, or to view other episodes of this program, you can go to capecodwriterscenter.org.